stuff that we're going to cover is going to be fun and very interesting, but some of it's going to be a little bit dry and academic, but please track with me the whole time. Let me grab your whole brains for an hour, and I'm going to take you guys through a fun, fun journey. I want to talk a little bit first about how I got here. So I'm a behavioral scientist by training. I spent about 20 years of my life uh, testifying as an expert in state and federal court cases on the behavioral sciences field. I would talk about statistics and evidence and research. I would go to court cases and testify as an expert. I have a PhD in organizational psychology and I own research and evidence. I love science and I love the scientific method. I've been a Christian since I was about age 11. I walked away from Christ until I was about age 17, went through kind of a little rebellious streak there, but came back to Christ ever since I was about age 17. But ever, ever since I was a Christian, I wasn't quite sure about how to take the Genesis account. I even went to seminary, and in seminary they taught me, hey, if you want to believe in the Hebrew or the Bible, whoever was writing the original manuscripts of the Bible believed that the six days of creation were real, ordinary days. And if you take the, the genealogies in Genesis chapters 5 and 10, they track back to Adam who was created just thousands of years ago. But then at the same breath, the, 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 um, the theologian told me, well, if you, but if you want to believe in science, earth has to be millions of years old, so you guys just go figure it out. That was the message that I got in seminary. So, and I kind of lived in that, in that space of undecided about the book of Genesis until eight years ago, I went to a talk very much like this one about did man walk with dinosaurs? And it was a talk given to us by Dave Bisbee, the guy who's the vice president of our ministry today. He's, you probably saw him when he came in. He just talked to your guys as, uh, I think, the third through fifth graders. I went to his talk about eight years ago, and you know what I was thinking the whole time? I was thinking, I can't believe this guy believes that man walked with dinosaurs. That's crazy, because I remember the History Channel and Nova and all these science shows and all the movies I've ever seen. They all conditioned me. The dinosaurs went extinct 66 million years ago when the asteroid landed in the Yucatan Peninsula and blew up everything and all the dinosaurs died in a big dust storm. That's how I was conditioned by the world. So I went into this guy's talk going, I just can't believe this guy's going to stand up here at church and say, man, walk with dinosaurs. This is just craziness. I go into his talk as a skeptic, and about halfway through, I'm listening to his evidence through the lens of an expert researcher. I had spent, as I mentioned, 20 years testifying over 100 state and federal court cases. I know how to weigh evidence and research. That was my field. And I'm like, well, what is this guy going to know about evidence? So he starts talking about this stuff, and he goes over all the evidence about why is it that there's 18 different people groups around the world, pretty much on every country in the world today, and they all have myths and legends and drawings and figurines of dinosaur-like creatures that they call dragons, but they all look similar across all these different countries. I'm like, yeah, he's got a really good point there. And why is it that all the way up until the medieval times with the knights, we heard about men slaying dragons? And those dragons, when they would draw pictures about them and talk about them, they looked an awful lot like theropods and pterosaurs, known species of dinosaurs. I'm like, that is very interesting. Then he brings out the heavyweight stuff. He says, if dinosaurs went extinct 66 million years ago, then why do we pull out their femur bones from the dirt layers of Montana right now? And why, when they're digging out the big femur bones from the dirt layers of Montana, do the paleontologists say that the earth that they're digging these bones out of still has a stench of death to it? And I thought, yeah, that doesn't make much sense. If those bones are 66 million years old, years old, how can they still smell like death? And then when they cut the bones open because they're too big to bring out with the helicopter and they have to cut them in half, and they look on the inside of the bones and notice that there's veins popping out of bones that are supposed to be 66 million years old, how does that line up with science? I'm like, yeah, that doesn't make much sense at all. Then he kept going over and over. Why is there this kind of soft tissue and this kind of soft tissue and that kind of soft tissue? So I spent about three months looking into all the claims that this guy's brought out. And I'm like, yeah, why is it that thousands of other scientists still believe that dinosaurs lived recently and went extinct in the flood and lived, some of them lived, lived afterwards? 
I went over all that evidence, spent three months of my life looking into it. I bought, I kid you not, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of books and DVDs. I had to know if this was the real case. I flew up to Montana, did firsthand dinosaur research up there. I flew all the way up to Canada, looked at the dinosaur bone beds up there. I went to a place called Hilda, Canada, where you can look for 14 miles. And as far as your eyes can see, you see dead dinosaurs buried with clams, fish, and all kinds of mammals. And I thought, my gosh, what in the world could do that? What could bury a 14-mile stretch of dinosaurs? It had to be a worldwide flood. So about half the way through this research, I finally turned my computer screen aside and I said, you know what? It's all true. I've been duped. I've been lied to by the world. The dinosaurs didn't go extinct 66 million years ago. They went extinct, most of them, just recently, about 4,500 years ago in a worldwide flood. And you know what? The six days of creation, they're ordinary days of creation because why else would God himself take the only part of scripture he wrote with his own fingers. You read the whole Bible, there's only one scrap piece in here that God wrote directly by himself with his own hand, and it's the Ten Commandments. So why would God put in the Ten Commandments, in the fourth one, he said, for in six days I created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. So when God was telling that to the Israelites, what did he want them to believe? six days or six millennia or six era or six gaps, whatever it was, he had to mean six real ordinary days because God could have created in six minutes or six months or six years, but he, he chose to take six days because he was setting up a rhythm for humans that he gave dominion over the earth to take charge over because he wanted us to work for six and rest for one. That's why God chose to take six long days. He could have taken six minutes, but he chose not to. So that's what I did. I chose to believe that. And you guys know what happened to me right after I submitted myself under God's word and said, I'm just going to trust it, how it's written at the beginning. All of a sudden, I got an awakening where God showed me through my life journeys all kinds of evidence that makes it so true that the truth about creation and the flood today, you guys, the stuff I'm going to show you today, everyone should think creation and the flood is obvious. It's completely obvious, but the world has hidden it from you. So there are some students today who are going to walk out of this place and your lives are never going to be the change because you're going to understand that truth starts on the first page, the first paragraph, the first sentence. You don't have to get all the way to the New Testament before you start believing some of the things that Jesus did. It starts in the beginning. And you know what? If truth doesn't start at the beginning, check me out. Sign me off of the Christian faith I don't want in. Because if the Bible isn't true, why believe the rest of it? Why believe what Christ talked about in the Bible? Jesus mentioned the Old Testament 40 times in the, in, in the New Testament writings. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he threw back to the Old Testament 40 times. And you know, every single time he referenced back to the Old Testament, is, it was literal and historical. Jesus did not believe that Genesis was a mythical account. He treated it like a real work of history. So I'm here to say that in these interesting times we're living in today that might even be talking about some things in the end of the Bible, some revelation kind of stuff with whatever's going on in the world now, I want you guys to know, to be assured, that if God got the beginning part of the Bible right, he's got the ending part of the Bible right too. He's got the beginning in his hands and he's got the ending in his hands. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And all I want to do today is just take you guys one inch closer to believe in shifting over that Genesis is a real history account. Because if I can do that, and you guys believe in the truth of Genesis, then you're going to believe and trust God for the end of your life and for the end of this world, whatever's going to happen, maybe even in our lifetime. So just a little shift today. So grab your attention and stay with me, please. And we will go rapid fire through some fun stuff today. Okay, so here's the, the title of our talk today, There Be Dragons, Evidence Man Walked with Dinosaurs. So we'll start out with this guy here. I have one question for you. What does this look like? Someone raise their hand. Yes, and call it out. What do you think? What does it look like? Dracorex. It looks like Dracorex. He's exactly right. That's a species for it. Now, do you think it's real or fake? I hear some fakes. I hear some reals. 
Do, but what does it look like to you? What's your, what's your first reaction? What does it look like? It looks like a dragon. Yes, this is a real dinosaur skull. It's a replica of a real dinosaur skull that they found called Dracorex, but it looks like a dragon. And this creature over here, if we get to the end of my talk today, this is a replica of a Dinosuchus, and this is probably the candidate that's talked about in Job chapter 41 called Leviathan. Who's heard of Leviathan? This is probably the Leviathan creature, and I'll tell you why as we go through the talk today. So a little bit about our ministry. Um, we have several different movies uh, that are coming out. We have one that's coming out in about a year called The Ark in the Darkness, which is actually going to be shown in this theater. And the theaters uh, nationwide, about 900 theaters, are going to be picked up by Fathom. And it's going to be probably the leading flood, the leading movie ever done on Noah's flood. That will come out in the movie theaters in about a year, and they're going to show it here as well. Several other movies are out there for you guys for free. All of our stuff, by the way, is free. Grab as many books as you like on the, on the way out. We have a social media page. We're on, on YouTube, about 121,000 subscribers, about 11 million views total. Uh, we speak in a lot of different Christian schools. That's Dave's full-time gig. He goes around and talks in a lot of Christian schools. We give a lot of local church talks at a lot of annual conferences. Here's the two things I want you guys to take today based upon your age and your interest. The first is called the Debunking Evolution Program. This is designed for public school students, but it's great for private Christian school students as well, because what we did is we took the top 10 pillars of evolution that are taught in public school, and we debunked them with about a two-hour video with these two actors going through talking about it. And if you're in high school, make sure you go through our Seven Myths program. The book and the DVD are out there for you for free, or you can just go online. It's all free. Just go to sevenmyths.com. You can hit it for free. But these are the things that you want to learn about as a high schooler before going out to college. So make sure you go through. It's a good anchoring and a good rooting program called The Seven Myths. And here's our most popular book called uh, Answers to the Top 50 Questions about Genesis, Creation, and the Flood. We have thousands and thousands of questions that we get every year through our social media channels. We took the top 50 questions we always get asked and made a book based upon those. And you can download our mobile app. We have about 120,000 installations. It's free on iTunes and, uh, and the Google Play stores. Here's our movie that's coming out. It was done by the the producer of Genesis Paradise Lost. It's going to be a movie that's going to follow up on what happened after the Genesis creation account and talk about the flood. It's coming in the theaters in July 2023. Uh, we also have a book that covers that. We didn't bring in these books today, but you can go to, real simple, just go to noahsflood.com and sign up there to get updates, and you can download the free book as well. Here's what I'm hoping for you guys today is I want you to grow trust in, in, uh, in the truth of Genesis. I want your roots to grow all the way down because here's, we see two kinds of students in this world today. We see these kind, which is what we want you guys to be because deep roots are going to produce good fruits. We want you guys to have life, blessing, security, marriage, great, you know, great family, the whole bit. All these fruit are up here. They depend upon what your root system looks like. And if you think Genesis is a fairy tale, you're not going to have strong roots. Here's what we see is happening to not some, but sadly, most teenagers in America today. I would say more than half of Americans, uh, teenagers, are on this fruit tree over here. They're not having a lot of fruit. They're not thriving. Because when their roots go down and they try to start trusting in the Bible, they hit things off. What about like science in the Bible? What about ape to human evolution? What about Charles Darwin? What about millions of years? And their roots fail to go down to the first books of the Bible. But Psalms 1 says that you're going to be blessed if you meditate and trust on the Torah. And the Torah includes the book of Genesis, the first five books of the Bible. So that's what we want you guys to do is be uh, have rich, trusting roots in God's Word. So after this talk, here's some things that you're going to learn about. You're going to know about sauropods, which are behemoth in Job chapter 40, these magnificent, huge creatures. We're going to learn a little bit about those today. We're going to learn about Leviathan. Just a quick note, this is a 40, 30 to 40 foot predator. It's the largest predator in the history of the world, if you ask secular uh, paleontologists today. It weighed seven tons and eight dinosaurs. It would hide in the marshes and come down. And when it could lock onto something like, a, like, a, like an elephant, 
or something that would look like an elephant or as large as an elephant, it could get in this thing called a death roll. You ever seen an alligator death roll when it spins around like this? Imagine what this thing could do if it hooked onto the front leg of a huge male African elephant. It would take it out. It could take an elephant, hook onto it with its huge mouth, go into a death roll, and that elephant's going to take a swim. Amazing creature, and God describes this creature in Job, Job chapter 41. It says it's the king of pride, and it fears nothing. It was the top-class predator of its time. So we'll learn about Leviathan, and we're also going to learn about this mystery. Oh my gosh, does Job chapter 41 talk about Leviathan actually pushing fiery coals and sparks and flames out of its nose and its mouth? Very interesting mystery. We'll take a look at that. We'll learn, learn a little bit about this creature called uh, Drake Rex. And uh, we, we very much believe that medieval knights would go out and kill these creatures that looked like, uh, looked like dragons. And here's the biggest thing I have for you guys. This is what convinced me of Noah's flood. Every single one of these dots that you see here is not one, not a hundred, not a thousand, but most of these dots are like 10,000 or more dead creatures that are, that are in the fossil record. This whole huge range over here that's about 1,800 miles long, 1,000 miles wide, 1 million square miles in the middle of America is filled with dead dinosaurs. That's, this is a secret. You're not going to learn about this stuff in a lot of school. Look at every one of those dots. Every one of those dots is a massive dinosaur kill zone where they find thousands and thousands of dead creatures. What on earth could do that? What could take 14 states in the middle of America and fill it with dead dinosaurs. It would take a massive worldwide flood to do that. So why are dinosaurs important and why do we have to look at the dinosaurs and how they fit in the Bible? This is some theology we're gonna look at just real quick. The Bible says that God created everything perfect over six ordinary days, that at some point right after that, Adam and Eve chose to go against God and brought the curse of sin and death and suffering onto the earth as a result of sin. And then as a result of that, we have death that entered into the world. They were going to live forever, but because they went against God, they brought in sin, death, and suffering into the world. And thorns and thistles, Genesis 3 uh, uh, verse 18 says that thorns and thistles came into the world as a result of, of Adam and Eve sinning. So if this is true, and we believe that it is, death and suffering were brought into the world by our fault. So if you've got a... a uh, you know, a relative that you know who's passing away of cancer or something, that's the fault of humans, not the fault of God. Cancer and, and mutations and death and blood sin are all here because Adam and Eve, our parents, went against God and they thought they knew better and they re re rejected God and that's all these things come into the world because of what they did. But if you take a non-literal view of Genesis and believe in of millions of years of evolution, here's this is what your theology looks like then. You would have creation, and at some point after millions of years, this is what there, this, many Christians believe this nowadays, then at some point you have Adam and Eve, then you have the fall, but you have all kinds of death and suffering in the fossil record before Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were even here to bring death and suffering into the world. You see the problem? You can't have thorns and thistles in the fossil record and death and sin and suffering millions of years before Adam and Eve were here to bring sin and suffering into the world. That would make that their sin had really no effect and that would make, make death and suffering God's fault. You know, when God created the world and he said on the very end of his creation, he said, behold, it is very good. And right after he said, it's very good, he commissioned uh, Adam and all the animals. He said, hey, all the herb trees and all the fruit and all the vegetables, that's what you guys are supposed to eat. So God made a garden and says, all you guys are supposed to be eating from vegetables. And then we brought in sin and death and suffering and animals turned against each other and we started eating animals. But you can't call a world very good when you have a deer giving birth to a baby deer, and while it's still alive, it's being eaten alive by a wolf. That's not how things started out. That's because we brought sin into the world. So God's not going to call a world like that very good if you've got that type of death and suffering. So you really have two different views here. You have man's word 
says that evolution is time and death and over millions of years it led to these creatures they called shrewdingers all the way over here to primates and we walked on, on two legs over here, turned into some Neanderthal caveman guys and all the way up to humans. But God's word says that everything started out perfect and sin is what brought death. It's not the other way around. Man thinks that time and death through natural selection or how humans came about, but the Bible has a much, much different version of, of, of that story. So where do dinosaurs fit in? Well, we have about 6,000 years of earth history, and then uh, the dinosaurs were created as, uh, as land-dwelling creatures on day six. And then we have the fallen corruption comes in. We have about 1,656 years before the flood, and 85 dinosaur kinds were preserved at that time on the ark. The dinosaurs were brought onto the ark about 4,500 years ago. The rest of them went extinct. The 85 kinds that came off, came off from the ark like a year after the flood, because the flood was 371 days, after that they came into a very, very different world. They were hunted, they were hungry, and they were not equipped for living in a post-flood world. So the dinosaurs quickly went extinct after the flood, but they were definitely brought on to the ark. So we had about 85 different kinds that started reproducing. We're talking about world version number two, a much harsher climate. And there were mass extinctions that started because the ice age happened just hundreds of years after the flood. So let's look at dinosaurs in the book of Job. Is anyone who's read the book of Job before? Raise your hand. Okay, good, about, about half of us. It's an amazing story. Satan shows up to God and says, hey, your, your, your boy Job over here, I want to test him because I'm going to break him. And God says, you can try, but you're not going to be able to break him. So Satan took away his family, his business, gave him all these sores and everything. He's over here scratching his, 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 uh, his spores wide open with broken pottery. This guy was miserable. And then his, for the next 30 chapters, his friends show up and do all kinds of philosophizing with Job. Job, it could be because of this. Maybe you're a good guy. Why does God bring all this suffering in? What's going wrong, what wrong with you, Job? For 30 chapters, they try philosophy. It doesn't work. Then God shows up on the scene after all this philosophy stuff. And God shows up in a whirlwind and talks to Job about creation. God comes down and he says, Job, I want you to sit down and shut up and grab yourself like a man. That's exactly what God says. Job sits down and God shows up and says, Job, I'm the creator. God didn't comment on 30 chapters of philosophy. He shows up to Job and says, I'm the guy that made everything. And we'll see a short video about what happened uh, after that. Job chapter 40 describes a majestic creature using the name Behemoth, which means colossal beast. In context, Job and his philosopher friends just finished over 30 chapters of dialogue, trying to explain God and why he would allow such hardships into Job's life. Then God shows up in the world and tells Job to brace himself like a man, and says that he would be the one asking Job questions for a while. Then, for four chapters straight, God asks Job 77 rhetorical questions that all have to do with creation. After explaining to Job that he is a master designer of space and earth, God describes 13 of his great animals, such as an ostrich, horse, and deer, then caps off the discussion by telling Job about his two grandest creations, the behemoth and Leviathan. God calls the behemoth the first of all his ways, meaning the first in rank, the chief, the most supreme of his created works. In context, God is saying to Job, sit down and brace yourself, and now I will tell you the chief of all my works the biggest, most amazing land creature I ever made. When we scan through all land of other creatures, both living and extinct, which one comes up as the first in rank, the most colossal, or the chief? Clearly the sorrowful dinosaur, pairing God's word that behemoth is the greatest creature he ever made with the fact that sorrowful is the largest land creatures we've ever found, should give us a clue to behemoth's identity. So let's talk about behemoth real quick. It's at the very, very end of, the, of, of Job, and the whole book of Job, that when God finally breaks out behemoth and Leviathan, only then does Job repent. After God describes this creature, and God says, look, if you fear this creature, if you saw it in a swamp, you've got to fear the one who made it more than the creature itself. 
So that's what God does. Shows up to Job and says that. And the second to last animal that God describes is behemoth. And again, in the Hebrew, it means, it means beasts of beasts or colossal beasts. He shows up and says, look at behemoth and look at Leviathan, 30 to 40 feet long, seven tons, biggest predator to ever live. And God starts out with a majestic one and says, hey, Job, just consider behemoth. It's got a tail that sways like a cedar tree. It's the first of all my works. It's the biggest, baddest thing I ever made. Look at its loins. It's got power in its belly. It's got sinews that are tightly, closely knit. It's got bones that are tubes of bronze, ribs like bars of iron. It's an amazing thing. could stand in a river and not even, not even budge. Here's the 14 characteristics that God lays out about this creature. And did you know that some study Bibles today say, well, maybe it was a hippo or maybe it was a crocodile. But when you look at these 14 characteristics, they only fit a sauropod dinosaur. They really don't fit a hippopotamus, certainly don't fit a crocodile. It's got bones like a beams of bronze, ribs like bars of iron, the, the first or the chief in rank of all God's creations, which right there means it has to be the biggest, baddest thing that God ever made. So yes, dinosaurs are certainly in the Bible, starting with sauropods. Here's its femur, and here's a, probably a five to six foot tall guy, amazing, amazing design. If they crack these bones open, they found that they are like beams of bronze, just like the Bible describes. Uh, there's a footprint of a behemoth, huge, huge creature, and there's a leg. Look at the weight distribution system. It goes from a hip socket, and watch this. It goes from one femur to two shin bones to several foot bones and to several toe bones. That is physics, how you can distribute weight through one to two to many down to the toes like that. If it was the other way around, the whole thing would collapse. So here's a diplodic, as you can look at this amazing design creature here. If we zoom in on these things called the chevron bones, they're linking and connecting points for the muscles and tendons. And without those, the creature would fold its neck in half and be able to, it would suffocate. Couldn't breathe, couldn't drink, couldn't eat. Perfect, perfect design here that God made. And if you zoom in uh, even closer, it's, it's its design. Look at that. You can't have a long neck without a long tail, and you can't have a long tail without a long neck because engineers that work on building bridges say, well, you need what's called tension loading and compressive loading to distribute and carry the weight. Some people have more remarked that it had a, a neck system that looked like a crane. Just an amazing, amazing design. Some of the vertebrae on, this, on these creatures, we actually have a vertebrae right over here, but some of the big ones were four and a half feet wide. Imagine a one vertebrae over four feet tall, and the higher you went up its neck, the more and more pneumatic they were. They were charged with air. So you see, here's the inside of the, of the vertebrae. You can see here, 90% of it were filled with air. They were like styrofoam, heavier than styrofoam, but filled with air because the higher and higher you go up the neck, the lighter and lighter the vertebrae had to be. So there's some amazing design features going in that. And look at this, the Bible says, he moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. So what does that mean? Let's zoom in a little bit closer here. Paleontologists have noticed they've found linking and connecting points for muscles and tendons on the back of its femur that connected all the way back to its tail vertebrae. So when it would walk, it necessarily had to sway its tail as it walked. When they look at the fossil record of these creatures, they see the feet, the footprints, but there's never impressions of tails being drugged behind. So they're always carrying their tails up in the air, swaying it like a cedar tree, just like the Bible talks about. So what about Leviathan? Leviathan gets a little bit more complicated. God says it's very large. You can't even approach it or attack it. You can't negotiate with it. Its skin can't be breached with weapons, harpoons, spears, arrows, or a sword. And over here, we have one of its scoots. This is a replica of a scoot, which is the armor plating that would go on the back of a Dinosuchus, which is this, this creature. This one's about five inches. They've even gotten bigger than this. It's about an inch and a half, two inches thick. If you came up to this creature and you saw it and you're in a big boat and you wanted to throw a, a harpoon or a, a, like a hundred pound draw bow and arrow, you're not getting through this stuff. It's exactly what the Bible talks about. It's got this armor plating that's so amazing that the Bible says no air can even pass between it. So it's got terrible teeth all the way around just like this creature does. Amazing, amazing creature. God says there's no way you're gonna get next to this thing. Here's a life-size person over here to what Dinosuchus would have looked like. 
there's no way you could even approach this creature. Look at the scaling and armoring on the back of its, of its, uh, of its system here. Just incredible. There's a scoot. You can see how armor plated that would have been. Here's a, the, the same a fossil skull that we have here. Massive teeth all the way around like a door, the Bible says. It's just like a door with teeth on all, on all sides. And they've learned from the fossil record that it preyed on dinosaurs. It was capable of going in the marshes, seeing a theropod, and just grabbing it, going into a death roll, taking it into the marsh. It would be game over. The Bible says this creature feared nothing. But the whole point of God bringing up Dinosuchus, or a Leviathan-like creature, is that, look, he says, don't fear it. You should fear me more than you fear this creature. Fear its maker. And we'll show, a, oh, actually, no, no video on that one. Okay, so some people will say, oh, Leviathan's just some mythical creature. And I'm thinking, yeah, right, why, why would God label all these characteristics about a mythical creature and compare it to himself? That doesn't make any sense. He could have compared himself to a thousand-foot imaginary Godzilla. He didn't. He's comparing himself to a real creature. And God said to Job, he says, look now at behemoth. God told Job to look at it. So he was looking at behemoth when God described it. A very, very amazing thing there. So and what, what's all this stuff? If you read Job chapter 41, it's very clear. Something, there was some creature in the past, maybe this one as a candidate, that was actually breathing smoke, fire, and coals out of its nose and its mouth. The interesting thing about Dinosuchus is there's some interesting characteristics about its fenestrae or its cavities that are visible on its nasal system up here and up here that really have paleontologists confused because they thought, you know what, probably only really breathe from these two. We're not sure what the snout stuff is for. And so there's some mystery going on with its nasal cavity and they know it was connected to its respiratory system. But did you know that if we look at something like an electric eel, well, that's pretty crazy that God can make an electric eel that can put out 800 volts that can electrify and kill dino or, or kill uh, crocodiles today. Crocodiles will come up and try to bite this thing and it will actually kill them because it's pumping out 800 volts. So if God can make an electric eel, he could certainly make a fire-breathing uh, leviathan. Here's a little bombardier beetle that mixes chemicals from two separate chambers in its abdomen and sprays out 212 supercritically heated fluid out of its rear end. That's boiling water comes out of the butt of a beetle. Think about that for, for a minute. If God could make that little beetle one inch long do that, it could certainly make, he, he could certainly make a fire-breathing dragon. What about fireflies? That's pretty amazing too, putting these illuminating chemicals in the rear end of a fly. You can fly around, you can see it at night, glow in the dark stuff. Our God is an amazing designer. If he wants to make a fire-breathing dragon, he has no trouble doing that. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at what these things that are called pyrophoric chemicals, do you know that there are dozens and dozens of chemicals that when they're exposed to air, catch on fire? So God could do it. He could certainly make a fire-breathing uh, dragon. We'll spend the last couple minutes here going over um, the flood and dinosaur extinction. Uh, as we talked about, the dinosaurs went extinct during the flood. Well, the, the ones that... Uh, that 99.9% .9 of them went extinct during the flood, but the, some of them were brought on, onto the ark. But here we see the huge Noah's ark, about 450 feet long at least, and all the dinosaurs drowning underneath here. These six guys in the 1990s, I'm going to say very emphatically, they nailed it. They figured out what happened during Noah's flood. We can go back and rewind history. They can tell us when it happened and how it happened. I'm going to give you guys a highlight of it. It all has to do about the fountains of the great deep. Underneath the fountains of the great, the great deep, we had underwater rifting as Earth split apart. We have linear, linear steam jets that are going up from the ocean here, bringing tsunamis up into the land over and over again. And we know that these continental plates split apart from what used to be a Pangaea-like formation. And this, here's a mid-Atlantic ridge. There are 40,000 miles of these rift systems that were the fountains of the great deep 
that split open when the, when the flood started. Because the Bible says on the same day, the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of heaven were open. And for 150 days, the water prevailed and rose up on, the, on earth as Pangea split apart. And we have all kinds of evidence that proves this. Here's what the linear rifts look like. It's still present on earth. It goes around the globe 1.9 times, a 40,000 mile system. You can go today and see where the fountains of the great deep are, including this big one called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Here's what it looks like on a National Geographic map. It's called a bathymetric map. When you take all the water off, look at this huge rift with these slopes on each side. You can see the big continental shelves over here. Here's what it looks like on another map. It's a 10,000 mile tear that goes down the middle of Earth like a baseball seam, rips down, that split apart, and we can see how the continents perfectly fit together on either side of this big split. That all happened during a year in Noah's flood. The continents moved apart between three and five miles per hour. These scientists have worked out all this, how all this stuff works. It's called seafloor spreading. When the magma rose, it came up, got rapidly cooled by the sea, created new seafloor that went up to on either side of it. And when it comes over and hits the land masses, it subducts and goes under, underneath the land mass. It's called a downriding plate with an overriding plate. And that's what's causing the tsunamis that are burying the dinosaurs. So here's the magma coming up, creating new seafloor. And the seafloor is spreading on each side. And we can go see it today. It's still, still there right in the middle of the earth. It's very, very obvious. When the new seafloor spreading comes over here and hits the land mass, it subducts and then it binds and grabs tension right over here. This is what happened in the Japan tsunami. Grabs tension in Japan, the, the seafloor shifted by 60 feet. During the flood, it was happen, happening much more rapidly in cycles. When that happens, it pushes tsunamis up onto land. So we have the seafloor spreading. We can see the subduction going on. All of this is what's happening during, during Noah's flood. So here we see the seafloor is spreading. It's granting that, lab, uh, that, that uh, land mass, like, like, like over here would be California. It's gonna build up tension and tension. It's gonna release. And when it releases, it's gonna send a tsunami up. These were coming up onto land every five or 10 minutes or so during the flood, during the Zuni stage of the flood. We know this from the fossil record. This is what's carrying the, up so much mud and silt and sediment. It's burying the dinosaurs in the middle of America that's how you get this huge kill zone, 1,800 miles long, 1,000 miles wide, a million square miles of dead stuff where these dinosaurs are buried with fish, clams, and even birds all together in the middle of America. So here's the secular theory. If you go into a museum today, they're like, no, nah, no, nah, there wasn't anything Noah's flood. We think that there was an asteroid that came over here and hit the Chicxulub, the Chicxulub asteroid, hit the Yucatan Peninsula. But there's been some simulations run on that. And if that hit over here, it would only carry enough water to bring some tsunamis over to, carry, to cover over Texas and some other areas, maybe three meters high up here, or 13 meters high up here. But it's gonna miss this whole dinosaur kill zone right in the middle of America. So you can't say an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. It does not make any sense. In the middle of America, here's Montana. This is where they found a huge T-Rex. You can't have this little asteroid falling down over here and burying the T-Rex in 14 states over in this region. Let's see what happens if we drop, drop the rock. Here we go, the asteroid hits and it misses all those 14 states worth of dinosaurs. That's why you guys, if you go into natural museums, you're not seeing the truth of Earth history. Uh, that certainly can't explain it there. Here's more of what it looks like when we have the tsunamis coming over here. The plates are subducting. It's creating these tsunamis that are coming up onto North America in sheets, overriding and burying all these dinosaurs rapidly. So that's where the force is coming from. We have the subducting plates. It's coming up with repeating tsunamis, burying these dinosaurs in hundreds of feet of mud. So let's look at dinosaur taphonomy uh, real quickly here. Dinosaur taphonomy is a study of how dinosaurs are buried and what type of matrix they're found in. Do you know that dinosaurs are found buried in three different substances? Mud, sand, and ash. And you have to ask yourself, if you find a dinosaur under 100 feet and it's buried under 100 feet of mud, sand, and ash, how did the mud, sand, and ash get there? And why are they buried in those three things and not just one of those things? 
Well, here's an answer for you. You've got mud, sand, and ash. And do you know that the theory of catastrophic plate tectonics, which is what I just showed you guys, perfectly explains this? Mud and sand are explained by the subducting plates that are going underneath the land plates here because it's going to create tsunamis that are going to come up in waves and bring mud and sand up onto the continents. And then the ash is going to be creating because when the subducting plates dive under the continents, they're creating subduction-related volcanoes that are bellowing out so much ash to covering about half of America. Has anyone been up to Mount St. Helens before? Okay, when the Mount St. Helens eruption happened in the 80s, I lived in California. Do you know three states, it pretty much darkened the sky for about three days. And it put out about one, one quarter of one cubic mile of ash. So think about that. Imagine one cubic mile of ash, which is a lot of ash, it put up a quarter of one cubic mile of ash in the 80s. And you couldn't see the, 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 the sun for three days. The Independence Dyke Swarm that was bellowing out during Noah's Flood, which is found in LA, it's a 370 mile long volcano. You can go down there and see it today. It put out 4,000 cubic miles of ash. Mount St. Helens, quarter of a cubic mile. Independence Dyke Swarm, 4,000 cubic miles of ash. And secular geologists admit it covered half of the United States of America. You can go to Utah and see uh, stacks tens of feet high in the, in the earth of these ash layers. And it all came from volcanism that had to happen quickly. You can't do that stuff slowly. A couple more things and then we'll end, we'll end up with, a, if we have time for a little fossil tour here. Take a look at these circles here on your screen. This is an Allosaurus, and all of these circles are where they find dead Allosaurus skeletons. So keep, a, keep an eye on these circles here. There's an Allosaurus skeleton. What happens if I fly in sauropods? Look at that. They happen to be buried in about the same place. What about Stegosaurus? Same place. Let's put in all four or all three of these creatures. All three of these creatures are in the same areas with the same circles buried in the same place. How in the world do you do that? Where could you go on the earth today and say, yep, all the, all the deer in Redding, California, all the deer over here in Oregon, they all went to the same place. Yep, and the bears cuddled up with them and they died in the same place too. You never see stuff like that happen. It takes a rapid flood to bury creatures in the same place. And we're going to end up on this evidence because this is probably the most compelling. There's this thing called fossil correlation. So we have Africa over here in South America. This is before Pangaea split apart. Do you know that we have the same types of creatures that are buried in South America that you can find over in Africa? Because they were living across these regions when it was all one landmass. Same thing for these creatures. Look at this. You can find some creatures on multiple different continents that were living there at the same time. Let's look at what happened during Noah's flood. This is probably one of the most leading evidences you can have on Noah's flood. Each one of these yellow dots is a massive fossil graveyard. And here we have a couple of continents. We're going to piece them together. When you piece them back together, look what we have here. All these yellow dots match together. We had a whole ecosystem living together over here and a whole ecosystem living together over here. And if we fly in the fossil counts on these different types of creatures, look at this. The same types of things were living and growing over on this continent as they were over here. And when it's split apart, we, they're now separated by 3,000 miles. So when Noah's flood happened and the fountains of the great deep broke, broke open, this region right here was rapidly split apart. But now we have evidence for this because the same creatures are found on this continent as they are found over here. The only way you can explain that is a rapid, muddy, quick, catastrophic burial because these creatures are buried in the mud that killed them. Okay, the last thing we're going to end up on really quick is dinosaur soft tissue. I'll just show you guys this one slide. This, I think, is probably the most compelling evidence. In fact, I was uh, doing a debate once at a college, a secular college, and I said, you guys, it's real easy to debunk evolution, especially with, with dinosaurs. I can do it in about one minute. And people were like, oh my gosh, what's this guy going to do in one minute to destroy evolution theory? I just said, it's real simple. I said to these secular students, I said, your own textbooks, your evolutionary textbooks say 
that collagen, which is a soft material in bones, has a decay rate. Because if I take a bone, which takes, has bone mineral and collagen in it, and throw it out and cover it with mud, all the collagen is going to degrade. It's going to be, it's a soft tissue. It's going to be degraded. It's all going to be gone in just thousands of years. And there's been five secular studies that have established that collagen has a decay rate of between 10 and 30,000 years. Some studies say, well, maybe we'll give it 100,000 years before it should all be gone out of a bone. And one study came out and says, we're going to be so bold and say collagen can maybe last up to almost a million years. And I said, so there you have it. Your own studies show that collagen, which is found in dinosaur bones today, should all be gone in a million years. But you know what they find in dinosaur bones today? They're stuffed with collagen. And so there's no way you can have dinosaur bones being millions and millions of years old. The lie's been exposed. It's all out now. And it's not just collagen. Do you know that there's been 120 peer-reviewed scientific journals now that have established 16 different types of bioorganics found in dinosaur bones? Things like blood, infects, and histones, and proteins, and blood vessels, I mean veins. They're finding this stuff in dinosaur bones today, and it shouldn't be there if these bones are millions and millions of years old. So I think we will, we will end there. I would love to take questions, but what I'd like to do is just have you guys take the last five minutes and a really quick thing. I know we're supposed to break it at two and get you guys up to see these fossils if we can. Uh, Patrick, you think we've got enough time for that? And uh, the only thing we ask people is just don't pick up the fossils. Just take a look at them. You can touch them, but just don't pick them up. And I'm going to be up here to answer questions as you guys rifle through. So thank you very much. That was a fun time, and I'll see you guys next time. Yes.